Welcome to Mormon Book Reviews, where an evangelical encounters the restoration. I'm your host, Stephen Peinecker, and I'm very excited to have my guest on today, Brent Brandt Gardner. How are you doing today? Welcome to the program. I'm doing well, thank you. I get you confused with Brent Ashworth, who's one of my frequent guests, so I, that's why I called you Brent. Um, before I get started, folks, I wanted to remind you that this month's book drawing is 52 Churches in 52 Weeks, uh, so make sure you get your entries in by December 15th. There's going to be a link in the description where you can email me. Now, make sure that you put in the subject matter book contest and give me your name and address, U.S. Residents Only. Okay, so basically, folks, as you all know, I have... Uh, uh, I have a real close connection with many of the Heartlanders. Last year, I had Rod Meldrum on. Uh, I have uh, Jonathan Neville is a frequent guest on my program. And I just, I, I always felt it was so important for me. Uh, you know, as you know, I, I talk to everybody. But I ha I've had people who believe in the Mesoamerican model of the, of the Book of Mormon on my program, but we not specifically talk about it. And I really felt it was important that we kind of give like an overview of the Mesoamerican model. And, and I, I watched Brandt's interview on Gospel Tangents. By the way, I recommend check out his interview on Gospel Tangents. It's very extensive and a very well-informed uh, discussion he has with Rick. And so I thought, okay, we got to get somebody on. Now, last year I was talking to Jerry Grover. We've both been so busy. We just haven't had a chance to get connected. And I'm going to probably have Jerry come on and also kind of add to the, the, the Mesoamerican model as well so we can have this conversation because I think it's important that we do discuss all the aspects of the Book of Mormon. As you all know, I'm a I'm a fanboy of the Book of Mormon, and I am so in, um, interested in in many of the conversations that it has. So and with that long-winded intro, uh, Brant, I am so glad you came on today. I, Thank you. Uh, I am fascinated by the different uh, ask, you know different models that people have for the Book of Mormon, right? And and people have had speculations of them since the very beginning, you know. Um, and I always tell people, you know, it was one of the knowledge that the people had the had of the Bible. And the knowledge that people have, or the, the questions that people had about these ruins, these structures that were left in North America, really, it, it, the, the Book of Mormon anticipates all of that and kind of resolves a lot of those issues in many people's minds. And that was one of the main reasons why people were joining the church was because it was, answer, it was providing the answers to the questions that people had in 19th century America. Would you agree that be a fair analysis? I, I think some of that would have been why they were joining. I think a lot of it was why they sort of stayed and bolstered testimony. They got very interested in that, and then it became a topic that they, you know, that they speculated on a lot. Um, but I'm not sure that that was the original. You know, I think the original import of, of people who were joining the church were from these um, the basic restorationists that were around that were already, you know, the seekers that were already saying, yeah, this is what I'd like to have. And then this comes along and they say, okay, that's, that's what I want. And then you have to bolster your testimony. And obviously everybody wants to have, you know, all the right stuff. We want to know that everything is true and that everything happens. And so you see a ruin, it's supposed to happen in the new world, you associate it and that makes things better. To the original audience of the Book of Mormon, who, where do you think they would have put the uh, events of the Book of Mormon in? Oh, they would have put it in North America. Yeah. And, and I think all the evidence is that that's, well, and, and I said North America, they would have put it in the Western Hemisphere. The original model was hemispheric. So the narrow neck of land is going to be in Panama. And then obviously you have a, a land southward that's uh, surrounded by water, which is South America. Obviously, you have in North America, but I suspect strongly that in their minds, everything would have been right where they lived. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's so that's the original reception history. And of course, then oh, the, yeah. idea, the idea then um, is that the, 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 I guess you could say the Mesoamerica model is first introduced in the 1840s with some articles in the Times and Seasons where they were discussing it. Would you would you say that would be like the first time that kind of got on people's radar that perhaps these events happened some, somewhere else, elsewhere? Uh, no, actually I wouldn't. Okay. Uh, I would say that what happens at that time when they see the Stevens and Catherwood's plates that everybody got excited about uh, all of the ruins in Central America, they associated that with the Book of Mormon, but they associated everything with the Book of Mormon. So it's still a hemispheric idea. They're just saying, oh, wow, this is a cool spot. So it also happened there. 
so I think they they just sort of accepted anything and everything from any time and any place. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay. And, that's, okay. Yeah, and, and that's and that concept of sort of accepting everything without being critical. Frankly, I think lasted up until the 1970s, uh, where there was just very little critical looking at history and archaeology. It was sort of, you know, if I find a hole in the ground, it had to be a baptismal font. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, that's that's great, and I think that's just so fascinating. Is that you know you have this. The, the 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 ideas of where the Book of Mormon have evolved, right? And so now, so you could say that it's become what would become this the the limited ge geographical model, which was first proposed by I guess. Well, actually, I do have one more quick question uh, before we go. Yeah. Do you believe that in Pratt's uh, when he put in the uh, in in the notes in the Book of Mormon, the eighteen seventies edition, where he has the landing spot of Chile? Uh, do you do you think oh. that's the landing Lehi's landing spot? No, probably not. It doesn't seem to work with any uh, any geography that I can figure out. Um, where it exactly comes from, I'm not sure. Uh, Frederick G. Williams is the source of that, uh, and he was, you know, closely associated with Joseph Smith, so it's possible. Um, but I I don't see it as the actual landing spot or any revelatory information about the landing spot. Okay, and when do you have a do you have an idea in, within your model of where you think the Lehi's party landed? Yeah, I, I, in the Mesoamerican model, there's there's sort of two versions of it. So if I can, you know, give a quick description of the Mesoamerican idea, if you're thinking of Mexico and Central America, uh, Mexico sort of looks like a boot. So you get down to the Yucatan Peninsula; it's up in the toe of the boot. You've got the ankle at the Yucatan Peninsula, and Guatemala is sort of the heel of, of the boot. Um, the two models, one would suggest that there's more, well, there's two rivers, one going, you know, yeah, they both start really close to the same place. Um, but depending on which river you take, you change your model. And so the one I look at uses the Grijalva as the, as the Sidon River and the Yasumacinta is the other one. And the Yasumacinta is the one where people would say all of the Book of Mormon happens north and south going up into the Yucatan Peninsula. And I think it's heading the other direction. Uh, but for both of them, they seem to accept a landing point in the coast of Guatemala. Uh, so you, you land at the coast of Guatemala and then it talks about them going up uh, into the next land. So the coast of Guatemala, not too soon after that, has low foothills. You go up over the foothills into a highland valley. So that seems to fit what the text says. And, uh, and you think that they that they did a Pacific Ocean crossing? Make sure I make, yeah, I think it's Pacific Ocean for them. I think for a couple of the others, it's an Atlantic crossing. Oh, okay. So you've got okay. three groups of people that come right. in the Book of Mormon, and I think two of them came across the Atlantic, and the Nephites are coming across the Pacific. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, and we're, we're just uh, because I'm really curious about this kind of stuff, where do you have the Jaredites landing? Now, I would have them landing um, in, in <laughs> basically on the Gulf of Mexico. So they're coming across the Atlantic, landing on the Gulf of Mexico, and just perhaps somewhere in the ballpark of the ankle of the boot, if you will. Okay, okay, interesting. And then the, the Mulekites coming would go similar location. So I just want you to kind of give like a like a history of this development of the Mesoamerican model. So when when is this, because a lot of people say uh, that it was basically, is actually originated with the RLDS church was yes. really the very first yes. place. So maybe kind of give a little history of uh, how that kind of, that idea evolved within the RLDS and then how um, uh, Utah-based uh, restorationists also started embracing this model as well. Yeah, and, and, and frankly, I don't know how well there was much communication with the scholars between the RLDS and the LDS. Um, yeah, I really don't know what the connection there was, but I do know that it started there. What happens with, with all of Book of Mormon um, geography questions is people got very interested in them and then tried to find places. And what everybody did 
is you start with the narrow neck of land and then you try to find something else. Um, and, and the problem with geographies of the Book of Mormon is everybody can find a narrow neck of land. It kind of depends on how you define it. So everybody's geography has one. Um, so what happens is there is a lot of different ideas that are being tossed around. And in the RLDS church, they start off with this Mesoamerican model. Over in the LDS church, the, Me the Mesoamerican model starts a little bit later, but what starts is internal models where people are saying, well, I don't really know how to put it on the real world, but if you just take the descriptions, here's how it seems to fit. And those were very important because they were the first ones that started looking at the text and saying, distances matter. Uh, we really ought to know how far it is from one place to another. And the only thing the Book of Mormon ever tells you about distance is a day's journey. So now the question is, what's that? Uh, so somebody will come up with, you know, something for what a day's journey ought to be. They start mapping it out. And you'll see some of the early ones that are very blocky. Now, so here's the land northward, and it's a big square, a little tiny narrow neck, and then a bigger square. But those were important because they set up concepts of what the thing should look like. And then there were various people who started trying to put that onto a map. And principally, I suspect because of all of the ruins in Central America, people really wanted to look there because it was... Yeah, it was the place to look. That was where all the cool stuff was. Mm -hmm. um, and so then they started looking and things started fitting. And uh, you, you had a lot of people who were improving things. So um, M. Wells Jakeman comes up in the 1940s with a proposal of how to fit it into that geography. Um, John Sorensen was a student of his and refines it. Um, other people have, again, modified it. And instead of the Sorensen Jakeman model have gone sort of the one I described where you go into the Yucatan. My personal opinion is that what John Sorensen did is kind of the best beginning model of the Book of Mormon. It's probably as, as good as I could describe it. And I'm not a geographer. So if my interest in the Book of Mormon and geography has frankly nothing to do with geography. <laughs> that's true yeah and, and and would you say that like growing up what was where did you model it when growing up as a kid where did you picture the, oh, did you have a hemispheric model well you, when i was really young yes that's because that's what everybody was in church would tell you and and as everybody should know you know scholars go off and do their thing but what the community says is frequently very different than what the scholars are doing Mm -hmm. uh, and so, of course, my local community had no idea what the scholarship was. And so we just went with tradition and tradition was the hemispheric model. And I'm sure that's what I believed. In fact, I remember sitting in, a, in an elementary school where a teacher is saying uh, here, you know, all the Native Americans came across the Bering Strait. And I'm sitting there going, oh, no, uh -uh, I, I know better. It was all Nephites, folks. Uh -huh. Yeah. And then, of course, you start learning things. You go, OK, well, I, I was wrong. You know, there were better things out there. So, yeah, the, the idea that there was a definable geography does not really start taking hold until probably the 1980s. Uh, 1984 is when John Sorensen publishes uh, his ancient American setting of the Book of Mormon. And I think that's the catalyst to start most people looking at that area. And so, and of course, you actually had access to Sorensen's materials before he even published it. So may, maybe talk about maybe when you first started encountering his work, were, were you skeptical of it? Or did you just, <laughs> how was it like to be able to kind of get the inside story before he published it? Yeah, um, I, I had started looking at Mesoamerican things, and I, I was actually very critical of a lot of things that the church had been putting out, and, and not, by church, I mean church members, not the official church, um, because every time they put something out, it was, like I said, it was, you know, if there's a hole in the ground, it must have been a baptismal font, right. uh, and you know, anything from any time period in any location, you know that can't be true. You, you know that it just doesn't work, 
And you can't really say anything about the Book of Mormon in a historical context unless the time period fits. I don't care about the geography, but the time has to fit. So, you know, ruins that come from five or 600 years later, they're really pretty, but they don't help. Um, so I was extremely skeptical of pretty much any geography that I had seen. Uh, and I mentioned that to John Sorensen, and he said, well, here's, here's a manuscript, you know, see what you think of that. Um, and it was reading the manuscript where I said, okay, now I think I can see how things would fit together. But what I had told him was, you know, I don't think we'll ever know where the Book of Mormon took place because nothing seems to fit clearly. Um, and his, his work convinced me that there was a place that it would fit. You know, I was going through some books I couldn't find. And this is, this is a uh, from the 1960s, a commentary of the Book of Mormon. This was published by the RLDS. And here he has a... Uh, there he is. Maps. Yep. Yep. So that would be like what yep. the RLDS model. And a lot of them have like the hourglass shape. That's kind of like if you're just yep. going to draw a map based on the description, then that would be kind of what you'd be working off of. And that comes from the uh, RLDS tradition. So, right, this, right. which I find fascinating because... You know, of course, they were they were that for much of the 20th century, the RLDS position was basically the the Guatemalan model. Oh, you got a book? Let me see what you got. All right, that's uh, that's a, a newsletter that comes out from oh, yeah. one of the groups from the RLDS Church. It's called Glyph Notes. It's from uh, their Pre-Columbian Studies Institute. So there's still people in the RLDS Church in Community of Christ, of course. Um, but there's still a lot of people who are interested in those things, including things, you know, this is the mural from San Bartolo. So they, it isn't something that has died out in, in that community. What I find unfortunate is we still don't have a lot of communication with scholars in the other community. Uh, I, I would really like that to be better than it is now. Yeah, you know, and that reminds me of my, my good friend, Christopher Thomas, who, of course, uh, came up with the very important book, A Pentecostal Reads the Book of Mormon. Yes. And I do know him. And yeah, and he's a great guy. He's a good, cl close friend. And he's uh, the, the president of the Book of Mormon Studies Association. And one of his goals has been trying to get, uh, he says, we got, look, he says, I'm a biblical scholar. And we talk to Catholics, we talk to Protestants, we have atheists, we have everybody is 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 in there. And he said, and I get in here, and nobody's talking to each other. So he's trying to um, break up these silos, yes, and, and and have the conversation. And so he's bringing in people from not only just the RLD, you know, the Community of Christ, but also maybe people who left the RLDS just church who are more conservative. And he's 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 bringing these people into the group so that they can have conversations. So let's hope that that also happens with the geographical aspects as well. Yeah, uh, it would be wonderful if that would happen. And of course, this led to BYU uh, doing really important work down there as well. I mean, that that really was an important impetus uh, that the, the Brigham Young University has played a very major role in the uh, studies of Mesoamerican history. They have, and that that story is you know, another long one that we probably don't have time for the whole thing. So I'll you know digest the important parts. Um, you, you, so, People went to the church and they said, we ought to start looking here for Book of Mormon stuff. And the church was originally sort of saying, yeah, we don't want to do that. Eventually, they were convinced that it was something that somebody ought to do. But what was interesting was their approach to it, because they said, yes, go down there, but do good archaeology. Don't mention anything about the Book of Mormon in your publications. Don't, uh, you know, don't overtly use the Book of Mormon for anything. It says go down there and just do good archaeology. And the New World Archaeological Foundation had a very good reputation because it brought other people in and it simply did good archaeology. Uh, now, there were people associated that who were Latter-day Saints and took information from that. John Sorensen was involved. Uh, a lot of his information and ideas came from those time periods. He was one of the early ones there. Um, so things came from it, but the church's official position was, yeah, don't talk about it. That's not what you're here to do. So I am just wondering, one of the things, of course, when I think of these different models and stuff like that, uh, is what do you do with 
Joseph Smith's letter when he's doing Zion's camp. And he says, and we are wandering amongst the plains of the Nephites. What, how does that, how do you uh, deal with that? Well, multiple ways, I suppose. Um, one of them is there is nothing, there is no location in the Book of Mormon that's called Plains of the Nephites. So if that was supposed to be a definition saying, here is a land that's called Plains of the Nephites, it's not Book of Mormon times. Um, so after the Book of Mormon is over, there are people left and uh, there is a uh, a known migration of people from Central America heading up into um, the Mississippi Valley area. Cahokia is strongly influenced by Mesoamerican uh, concepts. And so we know that there is a movement of people northward. So perhaps that's what it is. Um, in my opinion, perhaps it is also simply that Joseph Smith is still at the point where he is speculating that it, Book of Mormon happened everywhere. So of course that's what happened is you know they're on the plains of the Nephites. Um, so I'm not terribly worried about that. If it has anything to do with, with Book of Mormon people, it is post Book of Mormon time. Okay, okay, that's interesting. And then of course that leads us to Zelf's Mound. Um, what do we do with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, personally, I think that's just a great story. Okay. Um, I, I, I don't accept that one as revelation. Okay. Uh, I think if we dig into the archaeology of that one, we'll find out that they were having a good story night. Um, the, the ruins are just too new in that area uh, for that to have been an accurate description. Okay. Uh, okay. That's it. very, very interesting to me. Okay. I, I appreciate you. Uh, uh, and then, of course, there's the criticisms that Michael Coe um, level against the the, uh, the Mesoamerican model. And one of the key criticisms he makes is that it's not so much what's in the Book of Mormon that he, ha he has a problem with, it's what's not in the Book of Mormon. Why isn't chocolate discussed? Why why aren't we talking about jaguars? Why don't you maybe address some of the criticisms that, that Michael Cole made against uh, your model? Yeah, and there were sort of two of them. Uh, you know, one of the sets of them, you know, was that there are things missing um, or, or animals or things that are mentioned in the Book of Mormon that don't fit the context. Um, that's a pretty common one. You know, you get, you know, well, there, there's any number of them. Um, most of what happens is people tend to forget that the Book of Mormon is translation literature. Um, it, if English were the original language of the text, I could tell you why it wasn't true immediately. You know, there's, there's all kinds of things there where you'd say, okay, English, if you're telling me this is an English text from that time period, first of all, English didn't exist at that time period. So I know you're, you know, blowing smoke. So it's translation literature. And now the question becomes, you know, what do you do when you're seeing a translation of something and you don't know what was behind it? If we only looked at the translation of things, we would no longer be able to use the King James Bible because there are things like unicorns in the King James Bible. Well, we can go back to original texts and find out about those. We don't have that luxury uh, in the Book of Mormon. Boy, I wish we did. Um, the other kinds of things where he says, you know, things that are missing, you know, why don't you have jaguars and chocolate? Well, a couple of reasons. One is if you're translating something um, you know, how do you translate a word you don't know? If you have no idea what that word means or what it is, how do you translate it? The second thing, you know, if you take something like chocolate, uh, chocolate was important for um, the hierarchy and uh, it, it was, you know, a media, the cocoa beans were a medium of exchange. But you don't have that many of those contexts in the Book of Mormon. You don't have uh, too many feasts of, you know, royal people where you talk about what they eat. Uh, there, there's no talks really about, you know, much food at all in the Book of Mormon. It's just not something they're speaking of. So to say that you're not talking about chocolate, for example, well, they don't talk about anything that they eat. So, you know, the absence of something that has no context is not surprising. Jaguars. Um, 
Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting because we don't know. We know that there are wild beasts, but they're not named. Um, you get dragons, but you don't know quite what a dragon is. Um, and, and so the absence of these things, based on context, based on the fact that it's translation, translation literature, doesn't necessarily bother me at all. Now, on the other side of that coin, if there were nothing else in Mesoamerica that did fit, then Coe would be right. So if you say, there, you know, here's a problem with the Book of Mormon that doesn't seem to fit in that context, if there's nothing that says it does fit in the context, then it's really a valid criticism. And you say, oh, shoot, yeah, you're, you're right. So you have to look at what in the Book of Mormon does fit the context of uh, a Mesoamerican location. And that's where I said, I'm not really a geographer. I don't care much about, you know, the specifics. S lots of other people will argue distances and locations and, you know, up and down. And, and what I'm interested in is whether or not the text actually fits that location. And then secondly, above and beyond that, I'm interested in what that location informs us about the text or enriches the text. So if we go back to a, a biblical model, you go to the New Testament, we know where the New Testament took place. We know the culture, we know the times, if we're scholars. If we're just the common guy sitting in the pew in the church, most people don't know a lot about it. Uh, yeah, no, yes, it, it, it occurs in Jerusalem. We know that much. We might be able to find Jerusalem. But they don't know the customs of the area. They don't know about Roman domination. They, there's a lot of things they don't understand. And so when you learn about those things, they teach you about uh, what's happening uh, in the New Testament. So you get the you know, if somebody slaps you on the right cheek, turn the left. Okay, well, we always talk about turn the other cheek, but we forget that it's right and left, and we forget why that's important. Mm -hmm. And it's important because if you are right-handed and you slap someone on the left cheek, it's backhanded. And that's an insult. It's something that you do to an inferior. But if you turn the other cheek, you make them treat you as an equal. And it isn't saying I'm going to be wishy-washy and just let somebody beat me up. It's saying, no, I'm going to ask you to treat me as an equal and as a person. But you don't know that without the cultural background. Um, you know, why do you have an eye single to the glory of God? It took me forever to figure that one out uh, until I learned that the concept in, in the new world, or in not the new world, excuse me, in the old world, at that time is that light came from inside the body and came out the eyes. So it we all know the light goes in. They thought it came out. They thought there was some kind of a light. And all of the light they knew was an oil light. And if you have a lamp that has impurities in it, that lamp flickers. And the word for I single is actually unmixed. Well, unmixed, therefore, is you've got to have pure oil to get pure sight. So, of course, you want the eye single to the glory of God, unmixed, purely focused. You want a pure light. Well, you don't know those things unless you've got a cultural background. Is there that background for the Book of Mormon? And that's the kind of thing I'm interested in. Um, and the answer is yes, there is. Um, in order to get to that point, there's a lot of other things you have to do. So, you know, one of them is, of course, geography. Without geography, we don't go anywhere. But once there's geography, now we start looking at people. Who lived there? When did they live there? So, you know, we go to uh, time periods. Book of Mormon says somewhere around 600 BC, somebody has to be there. Um, you know, were there people living there? Well, yes, there were. Uh, when I first started learning about this in, the, again, the 1970s, um, the idea was that the Maya civilization began in 600 BC. And boy, as soon as you said 600 BC, every Mormon's like, you go, well, yeah, of course, 600 BC, therefore it all matches and everything works. Well, that wasn't true. Uh, the better they found out, they said, yeah, Maya has been around for longer than that. Um, you know, it, and things grew up and it wasn't a, an infusion of the old world that made it happen. But there were people there. Um, 
we know certain things about the time periods and what happens at different time periods. And what happens is I started looking at the Book of Mormon to try to look at it, not only historically, but look at it chronologically to see if it develops the way uh, Mesoamerica does. And it seems to. Uh, concepts show up at the right time. Uh, the Book of Mormon has a very fascinating scene where the early community that uh, coalesces around Nephi says, we want you to be our king. And he's saying, no, I don't want to be a king. And they keep insisting. They say, no, we need a king. And that's really weird. How is it that the person who is leading this community doesn't want a king, but everybody else does? You know, why? You know, why a king? What's happened? Well, it just so happens at that time period, the cities in Mesoamerica are beginning to resolve into kingships. And kingship was the big thing. So, of course, they want to be a king because everybody else is a king. That's the way popular culture was working. So, of course, they want to do that. Uh, there are other things happening at that early time period. We have a, a discourse from Jacob who excoriates the Nephites for two things. Uh, one of them is you're uh, doing polygamy and you shouldn't do that. And the other is you're trying to get costly apparel and, you know, look better than somebody else. Okay, well, those are interesting, but why do you pick those two things, you know? What's behind that sermon? Is there anything that might be happening in that world that gives you a context so that you know what's going on here? And it turns out there is, because at that time period, you're beginning to develop in Mesoamerica uh, a different type of economic system. And the way that you got ahead um, was to have people who... They, they call them aggrandizers, you know, people who are going to make things bigger. And basically, you, you create home industries. Well, if you create a home industry, where do you get your workers from? In, in traditional societies, you get them from your children. And if you have more wives, uh, you can have more children and you have a bigger business and you can start selling things. Well, it turns out that at this period, time period, we also see that in Mesoamerica. That's not... Book of Mormon, that's Mesoamerica. Um, that's how this thing is developing, is you're getting this kind of thing. Uh, and then the costly apparel, once you start having trade, you get trade from other nations that starts coming in. And Israel traditionally uh, has been cautious of its connections with the outside world, because as you bring the outside world in, they bring their ideas and that could be a problem. The Book of Mormon has the same issue. If you bring the outside ideas in, then it could corrupt our nation, and we don't like that. Um, so you start to see those things happen in the Book of Mormon, and they're happening at that time period in that location in Mesoamerica. And that model had, you know, keeps going. I, I traced it through time. Um, the most interesting one, I think, that I found... Um, is an explanation for the demise of the Nephites. Um, we know that the Book of Mormon ends with the end of the Nephites. They, they go to Cumorah, they're all defeated, which is a really you know, sad story. And why do you want to write a book that says, hey, we were really great people, but by the way, we got all demolished and, you know, and we're gone. Um, but the real question is, why did it happen then? Why didn't it happen 100 years earlier? Why didn't it happen 100 years later? And if all you're doing is reading the Book of Mormon, you don't have an answer for that. It just, well, it happened that way. But if you put that into a location and a time period, you go, oh, yeah, I, I know what was happening around there, and I know why this is occurring. Uh, what happens in Mesoamerica in the time period that the Book of Mormon says the Nephites are um, destroyed you have Teotihuacan in central Mexico that is creating ties and frankly dominating places like Tikal um, in the Maya world. So Teotihuacan is coming down in. They want to create tribute lines uh, and they want to have better connections with these locations uh, you know, in the Maya world up into central Mexico. Well, at that time period, the Book of Mormon tells us that the Book of Mormon peoples are kind of concentrated on and dominating 
the land right around the ankle of the boot. Teotihuacan is northwestern of the boot. Southeastern is the Maya. To get through there, you have to go through Book of Mormon lands. And anthropologists will tell you that wars of extermination are really expensive. You don't do that, try and wipe out a people, um, unless you've got a good reason for it that has to be, frankly, an economic reason. Uh, and those trade routes that the, Mor the Book of Mormon peoples are sitting across, um, yeah, those are dangerous people now because they could cut the, the supply lines and nobody wants that. So all of a sudden you're saying, yeah, but at this point in time, there is now a reason to try and get rid of them. Uh, wars, yeah, you've had wars with them all the time, so you don't pretend you're not fond of them anyway, uh, but let's get them out of there and make sure that they're not, uh, you know, bothering us anymore. And that's the military economic situation okay, well, in I'm just really, America at that time. I'm really curious because like, are you saying then, because you say Book of Mormon peoples, which I'm going to say is going to be um, Nephites and Lamanites. Are the Lamanites working with an outside group to exterminate the Nephites? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. That's, that's what I'm saying. Um, now, definitions, two different definitions you need to know. Uh, one of them is, Lamanite means everybody who is a Nephite. Um, and, and particularly at that time period, it means that because you had a time period where uh, the Book of Mormon says everything is wonderful. We have this glorious time of uh, peace for 200 years. And, you know, there are no ites, there's no Lamanites, there's no Nephites. Well, then they show up again. Um, but the definition by that time it has nothing to do with lineage or anything else. It's you know, this is us and everybody else is them. So Lamanite and Gentile are probably closer related terms. Um, now, Teotihuacan in the Book of Mormon, um, I've made the argument that the Book of Mormon intentionally links them to what the Book of Mormon calls Gadianton robbers. Uh, and the Book of Mormon very specifically talks about these last times. And what's fascinating is in the, in the Book of Mormon, inside the Book of Mormon, where Mormon, who's the last writer, uh, is telling his story, he starts off by saying, we've had these wars and we're victorious. And through most of the Book of Mormon that Mormon is writing, eventually the Nephites are victorious. So they start to have wars again. You go, yeah, here's wars again. They should be victorious. And you start off and you get this first one. And then all of a sudden, Gadianton show up with the Lamanites and they turn around, the Nephites turn around and run. They say, okay, we're defeated, we're gone. Hmm. And they're, from that time on, they have small skirmishes, but they're in trouble. Well, again, if the Gadianton robbers is the way that Mormon is referring to the Teotihuacanos, the Teotihuacanos were the military strength. They were the ones where you go, oh man, I see them coming. We're in trouble now because they're the ones that have beat up everybody. Um, so I think I see in the Book of Mormon exactly what's happening at that time period in Mesoamerica. So back to how this all started, and you asked me about Co. Uh, yeah, I think Co has some things that we have to talk about and you have to explain. But on the other side, there's other stuff that fits so well that... Uh, that I'm not bothered by the fact that I have to understand what Co is saying, because we all have to understand the rest of this that's also important. Okay, I want to get back to some uh, more things. There's a few things I'm just interested in. You referred to sure. the translation process. I'm, I'm wondering, how are you engaging Joseph Smith? What kind of translator was he? If Because some say that basically the word would appear... Mm -hmm. And then yeah. it had to be correct, and then it would disappear. But you, yeah. you seem to say that the translator was also engaged, was also maybe as a, a traditional translator, where he's kind of bringing <laughs> himself into it. That's a, explain, talk to me about that. Yeah, um, that is currently a large topic of discussion in the LDS community. So uh, there is no resolution. That, I mean, I can't say, well, this is what everybody thinks, because everybody doesn't think that. Um, so you, you asked for my opinion, so you get my opinion, okay? Um, you look at what the witnesses to the translation said, and they're not, they don't see what Joseph saw, so they don't know. The whole idea that 
uh, he had it had to be done correctly because they'd read it back and it had to be perfect. Um, that's based on the fact that there was there were some corrections in the manuscript of spellings of words. And so we know that there was a correction mechanism and it worked for the spelling of words and people who watched the process and witnessed it could see that and hear that and say, ah, there was a correction process. So it had to be perfect. The rest of the evidence is it didn't continue. Once it was correct for the first time, then it could fade over time and it got worse. Um, there was one time in the printer's manuscript where Oliver Cowdery is copying something and um, he copies down Helam where it should have been Helaman. And it happens like 16, 17 times and he has to go back and correct it. Um, so we know from what Royal Skousen has done with the manuscript that the idea that it was absolutely perfectly dictated is not correct which means that what the witnesses say is probably what Joseph Knight said. He says, so we see that it is marvelous. And I think what we're seeing from them is the testimony that we see that it's marvelous. That's what you want to do. It, it's God driven. I see God in it. And so you want to explain it that way. And I think that's the way they do it. Now, the rest of the evidence that you look at, um, there are some arguments about it. Um, currently, there is an idea that uh, you, you see early modern English and Joseph Smith couldn't have done that. Um, I don't really agree that that's a useful argument. Um, uh, other people imitated the King James Version. There was pseudo-archaic language being used at that time period. It was extremely popular. Um, some of the same forms show up. Uh, so I don't see that as a very strong argument. From all I look at, both inside of the Book of Mormon and then comparing it to other projects that Joseph Smith had, I think it's absolutely certain that Joseph's mind uh, was a participant in the process. Um, now, how that happened, I'll, I'll give you the quick definition. Um, I, I looked at some information from uh, cognitive science and the, there is a concept looking at how we generate speech um, that's called, in, in the, you know, why in the world when I need that word is it gone? Um, but there's a concept that says there, there is a mind that we have before we start speaking. So all of us have had the experience of saying, well, wait a minute, that wasn't what I meant to say. Well, if we said it, but we know it wasn't what we meant, then there's something that we meant that occurs before language. And so Steven Pinker has mentalese, there's the word I'm looking for, uh, use mentalese to say, this is what happens before language is generated. It's understanding, it's concepts, it's, and my understanding after having looked at the translation is that the thing that works best for me is that as Joseph Smith is working with the, uh, the interpreters of the seer stone as he's translating. Uh, I think he does see words, uh, but I think what he sees is again, a mental construct. Um, and I, I talked about that in a, in a book I wrote, but I, I think what we see is God giving the meaning to Joseph and then Joseph trying to translate that into words. He doesn't have access to words he does not know. Um, when he gets concepts, he will put concepts into uh, terms and phrases that he knows. Uh, so we get a lot of New Testament phraseology. Um, and I think it's very logical because that was his language. That was the way he understood religion. So if you're going to talk about religion, that's the language you're going to use. Um, so I think there was that flexibility in there. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's interesting stuff. I, I, I find the whole translation process to be fascinating because you have, you got the, uh, you have the seer stone, but you also have the Urim and Thummim, the, the spectacles. So you have two, two different modes of translation. I, I, pr I proposed to Richard Bushman this theory that I had, and that was that Joseph had the spectacles for the first 116 pages. Moroni then takes away the instruments. All right. And then he's returned, but he doesn't return to spectacles. 
And it's as similar to how when Moses, when he first when was he when he was up on Mount Sinai, he uh, God writes the, the Ten Commandments with his finger. Moses then uh, comes down, sees what the, the Hebrews are doing, smashes the uh, Ten Commandments, and almost as a punishment, God then goes and says, "Well, now you got to do it." And I sometimes <laughs> think the parallel is is yeah. that God said, "You had the, your opportunity to use this divine instrument now." You're going to have to use your instrument in order to translate. It is almost a parallel to the Moses and Sinai story. What do you think about that? I like the parallel. I think it works really nicely. Uh, from an historical standpoint, it isn't clear, which means your idea works well. Okay, great. And if people, if you're hearing any background noise, I think a lawnmower is outside. I'm in a 50-year-old mobile <laughs> home, so sorry about the noise. It's Florida. Um, so um, also, I just wanted to say, so I've had Simon Southerton on and Thomas Murphy come on my program. And they were actually on to talk about more about the Heartlander stuff, but they were the ones that, you know, over 20 years ago, both kind of put out some work about DNA in the Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. I would like you to address some of the issues that they brought up about that they're not, they're not being the DNA where we would expect it to be, it's not there, and how would you address that? When Thomas Murphy first came out with his, uh, it was basically saying we don't have the DNA and we should, and it was an absolute uh, demolition of the hemispheric concept of the Book of Mormon. And... I, they, you know, there's nothing else you can say about that. It's, it's absolutely true. Book of Mormon could not have been hemispheric. The people could not have all generated. And so that concept that many members of the church had, that Book of Mormon peoples started everything, was no longer viable. Uh, and I, I told you, I, that's what I believed when I was younger. Um, certainly don't believe that now. Um, you know, we just know way too much about how the Americas were populated. So the first thing is the DNA stuff comes on and it says, you know, the hemispheric concept isn't true and therefore the Book of Mormon isn't true. Well, several of us hadn't believed the, you know, the hemispheric model for a long time by that time anyway. So, you know, DNA wasn't necessarily a surprise. The question is, does it really do the damage that they suggest it does? And other people who are actually scientists who work with DNA have looked at that question and they say, well, no, given what we know of the Book of Mormon, um, the idea that we haven't found it is not necessarily shocking. Um, and, you know, let me give you the quick, you know, the quick one. Let's talk about Nephite DNA. You have two problems with Nephite DNA. One of them is we don't necessarily know what uh, Hebrew DNA from Jerusalem 600 BC would look like. So we don't really have anything to compare it to. We have general ideas, but not specific. Secondly, if you count up the people that were named who came in the ship coming across the water and then add a few people just because, you maybe get 30 people maybe say 50, be generous. You got 50 bodies that come in. If they land on the Guatemalan coast, like I suspect they did, there were already at that time period in the foothills, six different communities that had a thousand people each, all of whom could see these people coming. <laughs> you know, if there's a sail coming up on the beach, uh, yeah, I'm sure they were met with all these people. And then you take 50 people and they have to integrate into another population. They have to procreate. You really should not be having sex with your sister. So you're going to find a bride that isn't. And so just the whole idea is there's other people there you have mixing. You have the DNA of 50 people that gets mixed into thousands. How are you going to find it? You don't even know what you're looking for, let alone whether or not uh, it survives. Uh, and then we have the problem of uh, the bottleneck that comes when everybody dies off when the uh, Spaniards arrive. Uh, cholera kills them all, smallpox. Um, so it's not surprising that we don't find it. It would be wonderful if we did because the Book of Mormon people could go, oh yeah, see, we found that. Uh, but it, it's not there and it's not surprising that it's not there. 
you know, one of the arguments that I like to make, and again, I, I'm, I'm, I steal man arguments. I don't straw man in my program. And one of the <laughs> arguments that I uh, would make is that you, one could make the argument that the Book of Mormon is an ancient document because it parallels the Middle Eastern tradition of exaggerating the size of your troops and your armies in oh, your yeah. literature, right? And yeah. so I'm just wondering if Mormon is following that same pattern by sure. by 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 introducing troop levels and population numbers that are much that actually are much smaller than what he's portraying in the pages, which we also see that parallel happening with even the Bible. Uh, we, oh, yeah. You know, so would would you say that might be an argument in favor as well? Oh, absolutely. Uh, now, recently, we found out that there's a lot more uh, people in that area than we had thought, but I still think that the numbers are exaggerated um, okay. because they're too clean. You know, you, you get, you know, so-and-so with his 10,000 and so-and-so with his yep. 10. Yeah. Now, here's the next thing you need to know. Um, one of the units of the Roman military was a, a century, 100 people, but that was a unit often didn't have 100 people, but it was exactly. still called a century. Absolutely. The Aztecs had the same thing, and we know what it was. It was a unit of 8,000. Uh, now, because they're base 20 rather than base 10, um, if you were to convert the idea of 8,000 into base 10, it would be 10,000. It's, you know, that's your mental limit. Now, the next thing you have to remember about the ancient world is nobody could stand around and count things. You have all these people dead out. Nobody's going to walk out there and count everybody. How do you even keep track? Did you count that dead body or that dead body? So nobody counted. Uh, everything is an estimate, and they have no statistical tools for estimating. So they make them up. Okay. And, and right. that's you know common to the ancient world. It's not surprising. Okay. So I am, first of all, I just really enjoyed this conversation we had today. I, I, I appreciate you giving an overview, and 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 I, I have a quick question for you. I had uh, Jenny Champal of the Book of Mormon uh, Art Catalog on, and uh, it's 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 a it's a, they're building this uh, database of all Book of Mormon inspired art. And I was just wondering, uh, out of curiosity, do you have a particular piece of Book of Mormon art that you really like that tells portrays a Book of Mormon story? Um, now I'm forgetting his name. It's Bricky. Uh, Bricky has several of them that I think are very good. Okay. Uh, and, and one of them that I thought was particularly good uh, was a depiction he had of, of Mormon with the plates, but looking very much like uh, a Mesoamerican young man. Uh, yeah, I particularly like that one. Okay. Is it Joseph Bricky? <laughs> anyway, yeah, I like his art. I, I really do like his stuff. And I guess my question to you is, um, you know, the Book of Mormon obviously means a lot to you. Um, I, I'm, can, can you tell us what is your favorite Book of Mormon story? Oh, heavens. How many children do you have? I don't have any kids. You don't have any kids? <laughs> nope. Ah, well, see, I have, I, I have four. And if you ask me what my favorite child was, oh. what am I going to answer? You know? <laughs> So yeah, what's my favorite book of Mormon? You, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, and then I have one yeah. final question. Yeah, I can tell you that my favorite book of Mormon author is Mormon. Okay, that one I can tell you. Okay, uh, I'm I'm a big fan of Mormon and a big fan. I, and uh, frankly, a lot of my recent work has not been on culture or anything like that. It's been on the text itself. You know, how does Mormon write? What does he do? Why does he put this story here? Uh, he's a fascinating writer. And so if you had to give an elevator pitch to an evangelical, what would you say to them why they should read the Book of Mormon? Oh, heavens. I don't think I could do it. I really <laughs> okay. don't. Well, folks, I want to remind you, my, my one of my previous guests, Jeff McCullough of Holo Saints, is actually an evangelical pastor, and he is going. He's just a, he's going to be starting a series where he reads through the Book of Mormon and gives his reactions. So I want you folks to know. I just was re communicating with him last night, and he's about ready to start on this project. So we're really excited. And Casey Kern, I'm going to have him talk with him too because Casey Kern has that fantastic Book of Mormon online website that I encourage people to check out, and as well. Well. Uh, Brand, thank you so much for coming on the program today. No, thank you for having me. I had a blast. So, folks, I just <laughs> want to remind you, uh, don't forget uh, 
there are links in the description if you'd like to support the channel on PayPal as well as Patreon. I want to thank all of you who are contributing to the channel. Also, don't forget our merch store, mormonbookreviews.com. Uh, we have hats, t-shirts, coffee mugs, a lot of coffee mugs or hot chocolate mugs. Uh, and we have um, uh, a lot of uh, other great things going on. And I want to thank everybody for your feedback. Don't forget the book drawing link is there as well. But the most important thing, folks, is remember this. All the voices of the restoration will be heard here on Mormon Book Reviews.